Welcome to SAJ, Judaism that stands for all, society that for the advancement of Judaism, both truths. Um, we are here today for a very exciting day, a day full of learning and insight about SAJ, about Dr. Dr. Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan, about the impact of this institution. And I know that there's going to be people who are here this may have to leave later or come late and you know join us in various parts. But we welcome everyone. We want to welcome everyone who's here on Zoom. And thank you for being with us. We'll see you downstairs with the big cameras as well. So just a few words of introduction and thanks. Um, when I first came to SAJ to do my interview weekend, I think eight years ago, <laughs> is that right, Rabbi Strasfeld? Um, <laughs> I um, came here with a lot of trepidation because I was thinking, okay, this is the birthplace of ideas, Judaism without supernaturalism, and it was a little beautiful and intimidating and exciting. And when I got to SAJ and I chatted with the folks, um, I also got an earful about how there wasn't enough teen programming and the Hebrew school was a problem and, you know, and, and all these information about how it was also just a regular shul. So <laughs> with all the regular problems. And I think what has been true since that time when I first visited is that we really hold both, right? That SAJ is this incredible place from which ideas have flown, practices of Judaism have changed and evolved, the site and origin of so many creative ideas. And at the same time, it is also a congregation with all the foibles and challenges that are part of what that equation looks like, and both are true. And today, and throughout this entire 100th year, we really want to lift up both of those realities, the best of who we are as a congregation and the best of who we are as the ideals that come from this institution. Um, this year, through many programs, through many activities, we've been lifting up that legacy. And we're going to continue to do that today with a special focus on this institution and its impact. So I just want to offer a few um, thanks to make sure I get all those in um, for the day. First, I want to thank, um, I, I just want to say that I'm thankful for technology itself and how the pandemic has enabled us to bridge so many geographic divides and divides of people who need to stay home versus can be in person. So thankful to all the people who are um, with us online and also thankful to the tech wizards that are making it possible, Dan Woods and Sloan Welsh. Um, also, Caitlin Hayes and Judith Vogel for doing Zoom Tech at home. So thank you so much. We want to thank the administrative staff of SAJ, um, Debbie and Rachel and the building staff, Angie, Gustavo, and Freddie for all of their hard work today and every day. And I want to thank the people who made sure the symposium was well known, well communicated, the Kaplan Center, Reconstructing Judaism, Ritual Well, and in-house our team of the com communications team of the 100th, Jordan Diamond and Eden Sidney Foster. Um, I want to thank the executive committee and the 100 Year Steering Committee and volunteers for everything they're doing for this entire year of celebration of past, present, and future. And I want to thank all the presenters who have joined us out of their generosity of their hearts and time um, who are willing to come on a Sunday in June to New York City and bring your own wisdom and insight for this day. Eden, um, Sidney Foster stepped in and did logistics for this and everything with the 100th and has been fantastic, thank you. And now I just wanna specifically take notice and thank Nancy and David. Is this still, okay. Uh, David, you envisioned today, you thought of the whole idea and the program and this concept itself of having a symposium was your idea. Cannot thank you enough for bringing your talents, your passions and your energy to SAJ. And then you found an incredible partner in Nancy who literally hands in hand, you made sure every presenter was invited and communicated with and did so many hours of work. So thank you both so, so very much. We would not literally be here without you. Um, there's a tradition in, in our, there's a Jewish tradition to dedicate our learning in the memory of a person who has died. And I wanna ask that today that we dedicate our learning in memory of Dan Cederbaum, Zichrono Livracha, who died tragically just one year ago, or a little short of one year ago. 
When I first came to SAJ as the new rabbi, probably day two, Dan said, you have a 100th anniversary coming up. <laughs> and I was like, slow down. <laughs> I'm not ready for that. Um, but soon we worked together, we partnered together to create an annual program series to sort of lead up to the 100th anniversary, including a very wonderful program with the four living rabbis of SAJ that we did a couple years ago, and a really important program about the legacy of um, Alan Miller, Zirkon Ali Racha, that really brought a lot of healing to the community and wouldn't have been possible without Dan. So um, Dan, if he were here today, would have been sitting right there, part of this committee, part of this team, planning this event, and we know that um, he's with us in spirit and we want to dedicate um, our learning today to his memory. May we be continually inspired by him and all that he did for the Reconstructionist Movement and for Mordecai Kaplan. Okay, so without further ado, I want to make sure to get to Mel, <laughs> because that is critical. Okay, so, um, wow, Mel, you are such a beacon of light and wisdom and joy, and I'm so grateful to introduce you today. So this is uh, Mel's bio. Although Mel Skull is not a rabbi, his Reconstructionist congregation, and I would say congregations, in New York help him feel like one. He speaks to the congregation often and enjoys it. He has a PhD in Judaic Studies from Brandeis, a master's from Harvard, and a Bachelor of Hebrew Letters from JTS, and a BA in Philosophy from NYU. He has spent 30 years teaching at Brooklyn College, trying to convince a primarily Orthodox audience how a person could be non-Orthodox and religious at the same time. This year <laughs> marks 50 years that he has been thinking and writing about Mordecai Kaplan. His other devotions, about whom he has written, is Solomon Schechter, um, Henry Adult Sold, and more. Mel Skolt is the vice, is this still true, vice president of the Kaplan Center for Jewish Peoplehood, and his books include a biography of Mordecai Kaplan, an analysis of his thought, and three volumes of selections, which I know live at my bedside, from Kaplan's 27-volume diary. Um, his annotated collections are run from 1913 to 1951. He lives in New York City with his wife, his um, significant theological other, who keeps him alive, right? That's what you said. And um, she so far has been successful, and for that we are extremely grateful. Thank you, Mel. I am extremely happy to be here and to greet you in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the SAJ and it is also, in a sense, to celebrate my 50 years with Mordechai Kaplan and also to celebrate the birthday of Mordechai Kaplan, which occurred yesterday. And I think, <laughs> I think it was a wonderful idea to have this occasion um, at this point. Now, in terms of giving you insight into Kaplan's vision for the SAJ, I want to take you into Kaplan's living room in 1923, where he had a series of meetings with SAJ leaders, uh, and he also met in that living room, rabbinical students from the Jewish Theological Seminary at other times. They studied William James at certain times, and they studied Talmud at other times. William James and Talmud, that's an unusual combination. That's the essence of Mordechai Kaplan. I also believe that Hadassah may have begun in that living room, uh, Henry Edward Zold and Mordechai Kaplan were good friends. I also believe that Camp Ramah may have begun in that living room. And I see a lot of people shaking their heads about these organizations. I don't know if there's anybody that remembers the LTF, the Leaders Training Fellowship. I grew up, it was an organization to encourage study among young Jewish people, and I think it began with Mordechai Kaplan. Now, Mordechai Kaplan was 
compulsive. And so he, it's unfortunate to say, but he should have had a discussion in that living room. But what he did is he lectured to those people who were the leaders of the SAJ. And we are lucky enough to have his lecture notes. He, uh, his archive is deposited at the Reconstructionist College. And so I have the notes for the lectures that Mordechai Kaplan gave to the leaders of the SAJ in those evenings in 1923. And my talk is based on those notes and on what he said at that particular time. Now, before I get to that, I want to talk about the name of this organization. Kaplan um, had an idea, and it comes from the diary, uh, that it should be called the Society for Jewish Ethical Culture. This was his first idea. And of course, Ethical Culture was founded by Felix Adler. And uh, Adler was also a professor at Columbia University and taught philosophy. And Kaplan took every single course that Felix Adler gave. Felix Adler had a secretary, and his notes were typed up. And I am an archival historian. And so I went to the Columbia University archives, and I was able to read the lectures. I was able to hear the lectures that Felix Adler gave to Mordechai Kaplan. That happened many years ago, but it was a tremendous uh, thrill for me. I also found Mordechai Kaplan's uh, master's thesis uh, in the Columbia Library, which was uh, not among his best works, I must. <laughs> <laughs> so the point about Felix Adler and ethical culture is that Adler uh, rejected the idea that ethics must be rooted in the experience of a particular people. He thought it must be universal. He thought it must be general. One might say that Felix Adler eliminated the ethnic in order to replace it with the ethical. Uh, Adler wanted to be uh, universal. In a certain sense, one might say, he believed that you don't have to be Jewish in order to be good. You could be anything in order to be good. And that is a challenge to the Jewish people. Mordechai Kaplan's idea, who rejected Adler's rejection, believed that the Jewish community, starting with the SAJ, would be the vehicle of the ethical. That's the way it had always been. The particular of the Jews would support concern for all. That was the meaning of Jewish civilization. Jews uh, individually and collectively must strive for the ethical ideals. And I want to give you a series of quotations uh, from those notes. And the first one runs in the following way. If, and this is Kaplan talking to the members of the leaders of the SAJ, if we can get Judaism to function ethically, we can furnish the individual Jew with a reason for remaining a Jew and to bring up his children as Jews. In other words, one might say that insofar as Mordechai Kaplan was concerned, ethics was an attraction. Religion and Judaism help us to be our best selves. We all want to be good. And uh, the ethics and the life at the SAJ would help us to be good. That's what Kaplan told the leaders of the SAJ at those meetings. And all of the activities of the SAJ at that time and now are all geared towards that 
goal. Now, to do this, Kaplan had to modernize uh, Judaism. And to modernize uh, Judaism, he didn't use the word reconstruction at all. He used the word revaluation. And the significance of the word revaluation is that it comes from Nietzsche. And everybody at that point was reading Nietzsche. And the word revaluation, therefore, is very, very powerful. And Kaplan talked about it in terms of replacing outworn values, reordering priorities, and it means a dismissal of authoritarian religion. Kaplan, you will remember, left the center at that point, and he left orthodoxy behind. Now, in my mind, there are an innumerable number of facts that are emblematic and that are important. They float around in my mind. And one of the facts is the fact that Mordecai Kaplan's father died in 1917. And Kaplan was very, very attached to his father. His father was a Haredi rabbi. And even though it was a profound trauma for Kaplan. It was also liberating. It was also a matter of Kaplan was now freer in a certain sense. And so uh, this authoritarian religion, which had been very much a part of Kaplan's background and very much a part of the center from which he came, uh, encouraged him to be obedient, the most important virtue of traditional um, religion is obedience. One must be obedient to the halakha. Kaplan, in moving from the center to the SAJ, was moving from a more authoritarian kind of religion to a more humanistic kind of religion. In uh, a humanistic religion, the values come from within. They come from us. We are the ones that create Jewish civilization, and we are the ones that create the values. Now, Kaplan, in order to foster this new idea, had to modernize Judaism, and that comes from two primary ideas. It comes from science, and it comes from democracy. Kaplan was perfectly um, at ease with both the physical sciences and the social sciences. Kaplan's uh, um, being at ease with the physical sciences has to do with a uh, particular fact uh, that when he was a teenager, his father was concerned about his uh, growing radicalism. And uh, he hired a teacher by the name of Yehuda Leib Susnitz uh, in order to teach him more Nebuchim. He thought that because Kaplan was somewhere perplexed, he would be drawn back into the tradition through the study of more Nebuchim. The teacher was a man by the Yehuda Leib Susnitz. And uh, he was a very special person because he was not only a traditional Jew who had just come to America, he was also a scientist. He had written on astronomy, he had written on mathematics, and so what he wanted to do is he wanted to harmonize uh, Darwin with the tradition, Har harmonize Darwin with the tradition. And that was Kaplan's first contact with any kind of science and I would maintain that it was uh, the root of Kaplan's radicalism. Most people associate Kaplan's radicalism with William James and with John Dewey. And I want to say that it had to do with this teacher, Yehuda Leib Sosnitz, who was a maskeel and uh, was a, a, a very, very unusual person. I have a special 
uh, uh, connection with this man because he ran a Talmud Torah on 104th Street, and I live a block from that Talmud Torah. And so I really appreciate um, uh, this uh, person. Kaplan was interested not only in the physical science sciences, but he was also interested in the social sciences primarily, and that had to do with Emil Durkheim, who saw religion primarily as a social phenomenon, and that was very, very important. Now, I mentioned the sciences, and I mentioned democracy. Democracy, of course, means individualism. Democracy means to live, <clears throat> to live your life as you see fit. But people misunderstand because people think that to live your life as uh, you see fit means infinite permissiveness. And it doesn't mean that at all. <clears throat> what it means is it means that one must have consideration for the other. One must have consideration for the <coughs> for the dignity of the of the other. So Kaplan condemned Kaplan condemned the lower kind of individualism, the individualism which we find so rampant in our own society. Um, he associated it with the center, which was an orthodox institution, and one might say that it was kind of sour grapes <coughs> because what he said was that the center might turn into a rich man's pinochle club. <laughs> uh, now, the point is that Kaplan um, was against, I want you to understand this because I myself have been accused and Kaplan was accused uh, of uh, favoring a rampant individualism. We need to be careful because we all have a tendency towards being narcissistic. We all have a tendency to be indulgent. Uh, we all have a tendency to be egotistical. And that is the case. And that is the case. But it is the extreme of self-indulgent individualism which was off the table. It was the extreme of self-destructive individualism that was off the table. Any kind of aggressive individualism, and when one, one turns on the television every night, especially the other night when we saw that committee, it's about aggressive individualism of Trump, if you'll excuse the expression, um, uh, mentioning it in the synagogue. It is the <laughs> Kaplan was interested in a higher kind of individualism, in a higher kind of individualism. And he uses the following words, and this is a uh, quotation from those notes again. He said that the ideal is the complete development of the individual and the unification of society. The complete development of the individual and the unification of society. That was his theme, and I would say that was the program that he was advocating for the SAJ. Uh, and that was to be their mission. In my own work, I have used the word shleimut, which comes from the word shalom. And Kaplan, it amazes me that Kaplan, at this very early point, was talking about complete shalom, talking about complete uh, individualism. What he talks about the society and not only about individualism. Now, individualism and society, 
go together. You can't have one uh, without the other. Uh, when he talks about the unification of society, um, what he means is what we mean by integration. And he believed in the integration of the classes. He believed in the integration of the uh, races. Some years before, he had talked about this at the beginning of his diary. I have been reading the diary for 50 years. It has grabbed me, and it continues to grab me. I get up every morning, and I read the diary, and I find um, inspiration. The first entry, the first entry in the diary, it reads the following. Religion is primarily a social phenomenon. Religion is primarily a social phenomenon. That's not surprising from Kaplan. But the individual and his development or perfection may constitute the sole aim of religion. So religion always appears in a social context, but the point is the perfection of each individual within the group. I want to be a more perfect person, and I think you want to be a more perfect person. And that is the goal of Kaplan. So he condemns the lower individualism. He condemns the lower self. And he strives for a greater perfection. And which one of us does not want to be more perfect? Certainly women want to be more perfect. In other words, I want to give some examples and uh, of the way Kaplan applied his idea of higher individualism. And so perhaps you know, in the going back to the history of that time, that Kaplan supported the 19th Amendment and giving women the right to vote. That was to move them up to a greater uh, uh, perfection. And he uh, gave a sermon at the center in 1918, which indicates what his values were, and he based it on Rebecca. You remember Rebecca, who gave the extra water uh, to the camels in addition to uh, Eliezer. And I did some research and found out what it takes to water a camel. <laughs> it's not. A, she didn't give him a glass. It takes. <laughs> It takes many gallons, many, many gallons. So Rebecca was a very, very unusual person. And Kaplan used her as a metaphor for the empowerment of women, for women moving up to a greater perfection. And he said the following. He said, when women get the vote, they will purify politics. They will make industry more humane they will make justice to the consumer instead of profits to the producer, the standard of the market. Those were Kaplan's ideals, and he believed that women would be supporters of those ideals, purify politics, make industry more humane, make justice to the consumer instead of producer, profits to the producer, the standard of the market. I almost feel that in terms of um, Kaplan and women, I feel that women for Kaplan were the chosen people. <laughs> I'm sure my wife uh, likes that. And he quoted a particular verse, and the verse which applies to this new empowerment and the verse is not uh, love thy neighbor, and the verse is not the Shema, but the verse is from Zechariah, not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, not by power and not by might. That's Donald Trump. That's Harvey Weinstein. That's the people who are greedy for power. Kaplan said, at one point when I met him in 1972, there's enough in the world to meet your need, but not 
your greed for power and pleasure. There's enough in the world to meet your need, but not your greed for power and pleasure. Now, I want to say a word about Kaplan, the person, because people have misunderstood, and what they have done is they have confused Kaplan's personality with his ideology. Kaplan's ideology was rational, it was logical, it was pragmatic, but Kaplan's personality was wonderfully passionate, wonderfully, anybody that had contact with him understood. When I interviewed him in 1972, he kept on banging on the table in order to make its point, and he was 90 years old uh, at the time. Kaplan was a magnificent preacher. Kaplan trained rabbis. Every single rabbi that studied at the Jewish Theological Seminary between 1913 and 1963 studied with Mordechai Kaplan and studied the construction of sermons. And so Kaplan believed, however naively, in the power of the word. He believed that the rabbi could influence people's attitudes in a very, very significant way. And Kaplan was very radical because, and I'm going to read you something that sounds like it comes from Karl Marx, but it comes from Mordecai, it comes from Mordecai Kaplan. We must have a peaceful reorganization of the social order on the basis of freedom and justice a reorganization of the social order. Uh, and that comes from a pamphlet called The New Approach, which you've been putting up in terms of the exhibits here. And uh, uh, it was fundamental. The people at the SAJ were unhappy because many of them were very wealthy people and they didn't like Kaplan preaching Kaplan preached about unions. He was a very, very strong uh, supporter of unions. And there was a fellow by the name of Joe Levy who was a very uh, active supporter, very active at the SAJ. And Joe Levy came to Kaplan and he said, stop teaching about the unions. Teach about religion. <laughs> and, and, and so Kaplan, being a descendant of the prophets believed, uh, as Lauren believes, uh, that the, uh, uh, the social uh, and the uh, prophets were one and uh, the same thing. So this was Kaplan's um, uh, Copernican revolution. Now Kaplan, in his diary, I want to give you the first quotation from the diary, which is very, very interesting. Uh, no, I've given that to you already. What I'm giving you, uh, what I'm giving you, is an article that he wrote in 1914 um, uh, called "The Supremacy of Torah," because Torah was absolutely central to Kaplan's uh, whole program for the SAJ. And what he said in terms of Torah was that the origin of Torah was not significant. The origin of Torah was not, it didn't matter who wrote the Torah. What mattered is the way in which the Torah functioned. In other words, if it functions as a source of your values, if it functions as a source of your um, growth, if it functions as an, a, a way to guide you, then it is Torah. But it, it, it and doesn't matter whether it was like, uh, what's his name, wrote the, the Book of Jay, that it was a woman. It doesn't matter who wrote it. Function was determinative, not um, origin. In other words, Kaplan was a, a pragmatist. He believed in the consequences. He believed that it, uh, 
meant uh, that, 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 that uh, what was important was what would the function of these particular matters. Now, the point is that um, uh, functionalism or pragmatism is uh, a very radical philosophy. It's a radical philosophy. It is very characteristic, Kaplan, but it's a radical philosophy because it is open and it is future-oriented. You don't know, if you talk about function, you don't know if something functions today, is it going to function tomorrow or next week or in a hundred years? And so it is radical. And that's what Kaplan was um, uh, uh, predicating for the program of the SAJ, that the prayers and uh, that the everything about the SAJ should be, should be functional. One might say that the SAJ was a great experiment in openness. It was a great experiment in change because Kaplan, the leader and the founder, was um, uh, so wedded to the notion of functionalism. But um, uh, we have this uh, statement from Kaplan, which everybody knows and which all of you know, um, which I think is worth remembering. Uh, uh, and uh, that is um, uh, the tradition has a vote, but not a veto. I mean, the point is that uh, there is, just as there is not unlimited uh, uh, freedom in terms of uh, democracy, there is not uh, unlimited openness. Kaplan did have certain uh, ideas about how uh, you should live it. And he changed a great deal at the SAJ uh, in those years, uh, which perhaps you're aware of. Uh, at a very early point, he gave up uh, the Asher uh, Bocharbanu, the chosenness at a very early point because it um, contradicted uh, democracy. Uh, he eliminated at one point the Kol Nidre. I don't know if you're aware of that. Uh, people are shaking their heads. He substituted Psalm 130, uh, which is a very plaintive psalm. Mi ma'amakim kratichaya. Me from the depths, from the depths, from my kishkas, I call to you, O Lord. Uh, this is this is Mordechai Kaplan. Now, if you have a little patience, if you have a little patience, I want to talk to you about Mordechai Kaplan and Central Park. <laughs> Mordechai Kaplan and Central Park. I've always thought that I wanted to give a whole lecture about Mordechai Kaplan and Central Park. Now, the point is that Kaplan was a great walker and he walked around the reservoir. And he walked around the reservoir with a great many people, starting with his daughter, Judith. And I interviewed Judith uh, in the 1980s, and she talked about walking around the reservoir and talked about asking Kaplan questions and so on and so forth. And some of you, all of you, should be acquainted with Sandy Sasso's book, Judith Led the Way, because she presents Judith as asking question after question after question. The other people that Kaplan walked around the reservoir with was Judah Magnus. Judah Magnus, I hope, is a name for you. He became president of the Hebrew University. He walked around the reservoir with Louis Finkelstein, who became chancellor and president of the Jewish Theological Seminary. He walked around the reservoir with Ira, and he walked around the reservoir with, um, with, with, Jack, um, with Jack Cohen. Now, I said before that Kaplan was uh, a great preacher. Um, and the preaching 
of the activities of the SAJ, which embodied all of the values that I'm talking about, were incorporated in sermons, they were incorporated in classes, and they were incorporated in the SAJ Review, which is the journal that came out at a very, very early point. And uh, there are a number of essays, and I want to focus on just one of those essays, one of those essays which is called Freedom, a Spiritual Ideal, Freedom, a Spiritual Ideal, in which Kaplan talks about God. I have to re include God in my remarks, <laughs> otherwise I'll be in real trouble. Uh, and he talked to the leaders of the SAJ about God. And he was pragmatic. The question is, how can you be pragmatic when you talk about God and also be very liberal and open? Kaplan was the sociologist, become theologian. He was contemporary, and he talks in terms of the function. He talks in terms of the consequences of believing, the consequence. In other words, he doesn't talk about do you believe in God? He doesn't talk about the nature of God. He talks about what effect the belief has on you. What does it mean in your life? And this is the way he put it. If the belief in God functioned in such a way as to further the social values of individual worth and the unification of society. You see, there it is. He wants the individual worth of the individual. He wants the values of society. And when he talks about Torah, he emphasizes that. And when he talks about God, he emphasizes that. In other words, your belief in God must function in terms of ethical values. Your belief, whatever it is, in a certain sense, doesn't really matter. Um, we, in a certain sense, we ask the wrong question. The question, in other words, is not whether you believe in God because there are so many different kinds of belief, but the question is how does the belief function for you? Is it uh, a source of values for you? Is it a source of guidance for you? Is it a source of the, the ethical for you? And that's the question that Kaplan asked about uh, God and pragmatism. Now, I'd like to end. You've been very patient, and I appreciate that very much. I'd like to end with two uh, different statements. One statement is from Kaplan, and the other statement is my summary of what I said. This is Kaplan's statement. True religion is the will to face the world and change it. <laughs> I see Lauren is lighting up because I think that goes very, very much. Uh, and I sent this to you, I think, if you remember. Uh, true religion is the will to face the world and change it. The will to face others and to transform them. In other words, it's not only the will to face the world, but the will to try to spread the word um, and the will to bring forth the best ethical out of the worst. The will to bring forth the best ethical out of the worst. Uh, now, let me summarize. The point is that first, last, and always, Kaplan was dedicated to the survival of the Jewish people and 
to their civilization, which was primarily ethical in nature. He believed in God, and he believed in the nature uh, of the Torah, and that both of them must be understood ethically. The nature of that movement to go in that direction for Kaplan was the SAJ. And the Jewish people, collectively, and the SAJ individually, would be the agents of the ethical, would be the agents of the ethical. Kaplan believed, in other words, in a renewed ethical consciousness which would transform society, not only for the Jewish people, but for uh, peoples everywhere. And the SAJ would be the beginning and would be an agent, would be an agent of that transformation. And that was his vision for the SAJ. Thank you. Before we open for questions, um, I just want to say how blessed we are to be able to share this space with you and to learn at your feet as um, our tradition teaches. And thank you for all you do to illuminate and to teach this important, this important Torah. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. And <clears throat> So we're going to have a little bit of time for some Q&A. And I think um, I saw Barbara's hand first. And then we'll, I'll get to everyone. Yep. Uh, Herb, one second. Barbara's first. Barbara, right there. Go ahead. I'll repeat the question. Okay. You're first. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for this wonderful introduction and for your contagious enthusiasm. Uh, I have a, a question about a topic that you did not mention. Okay. Um, Did everyone hear? I'll repeat for everyone. The question was beyond the wonderful compliments of, of Mel. Um, what was Kaplan's approach to Zionism at the beginning foundings of SAJ? I wonder if um, evidence one is over <laughs> is over in this mural. But um, <laughs> but yeah. So we'd love to hear from you on that. Okay. The point is that Kaplan first last and always was a follower of Achad Ha'am. Achad Ha'am was the cultural Zionist who believed that the Jewish people must be prepared in their nishama before they could be moved <clears throat> and before they could establish a, uh, a state of their own. So it was that kind of preparation that was important. Achad Ha'am tended toward the secular. Um, uh, he believed that the will of the Jewish people in general would substitute for the will of God. He believed that ethics would substitute for the halakha. Uh, and those basic ideas uh, very, very much influenced Mordechai Kaplan from a very early point. He, it also influenced Solomon Schechter. It influenced everybody. Achad Ha'am was so influential that there were people that thought he was establishing a new kind of denomination, a new kind of uh, Judaism. His essays appeared on a regular basis and uh, they were absolutely thrilling. He wrote an essay, for example, called Shilton HaSeichel, which is an essay meaning the rule of reason. And um, it did, dealt mostly with Maimonides. But uh, Achad Ha'am believed that the Jews who settle 
uh, in the Jewish center. He also believed in the uh, uh, continued existence of the diaspora, which uh, Herzl, I don't think, did. Herzl thought that the diaspora eventually would disappear. And Achad uh, uh believed that there were centers, there would be places like the SAJ and, and other uh, uh, congregations and so on. Um, but um, I, I must say that one of the issues um, uh, was that Achad Am really didn't believe in the, uh, um, in the contribution of congregations. He, he didn't really have a uh, congregational idea. He believed that there would be centers, but that they would not necessarily be congregations. I want to say a, 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 a couple of other things uh, about Kaplan Zionism. I told you that there are all these facts uh, rolling around in my head. And one of the reasons why I appreciate this opportunity is that it gives me uh, an opportunity to share these facts with you. The point is that every single time that Chaim Weitzman came to New York, he visited Kaplan, and he came to the SAJ. The SAJ made Chaim Weitzman a honorary member. <laughs> Chaim Weitzman, a member of the SAJ. What more do you have to say about the SAJ and about Zionism? The other thing that I want to mention, if, if I have the space, is <clears throat> In 1925, the Hebrew University opened, and uh, <clears throat> there was a dedication ceremony. That dedication ceremony, of course, took place in Jerusalem. And Kaplan went to the dedication ceremony. He, uh <clears throat> excuse me, he, um, represented the Zionist Organization of America. He represented uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary. And of course, in a certain sense, he represented um, the SAJ. Um, Kaplan talks um, very, very movingly and at great length about the dedication ceremonies. They uh, occurred on Mount Scopus, uh, Har Hatzophim, and he talks about Lord Balfour as speaking on the Har Hatzophim for 45 minutes without a note. <laughs> the other thing that I want to mention is that Kaplan himself gave a speech. He gave a speech that week. Bialik spoke, and Achad Am spoke, and all of the leaders of the Zionist organization at that point spoke, and Kaplan spoke. And the uh, metaphor that he used was the metaphor of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle. And in a certain sense, what he said was that the Hebrew University would be the modern tabernacle. In other words, the Hebrew University was a dream. It was a dream of Buber, it was a dream of Chaim Weizmann, it was a dream of Albert Einstein, the idea of having a Jewish university where scholarship would be applied to the Jewish experience. And uh, uh, Kaplan said that that was an element of the divine and was the modern Mishkan. You said at the beginning that uh, Mordecai Kaplan had an idea for the name of, of the synagogue, and then you talked about uh, Felix Adler and uh, his uh, ethical culture. Now, of course, we know that Felix Adler started a movement called Society for the Advancement of Ethical Culture, 
and uh, I guess Kaplan reacted to that with with a, with a, with a similar name. Our, our name is there anything more to the story, or we were were we just supposed to connect the dots? Uh, well, the point is that what, what I what I wanted to say was that in Kaplan going in that direction with the name is emblematic of Kaplan's universalism, Judaism that stands for all was in his kishkas. It was in his innermost uh, soul. And uh, I was a very surprised to find that he thought of calling it ethical culture. But he had to reject uh, Felix Adler. He had to reject it because Adler rejected the uh, specific experience of the Jewish people as being a source of the ethical and of the universal. And Kaplan understood that it was the whole tradition of the rabbis and going back to the prophets, which was the marriage of the ethnicity, of the ethnic, and of the, of the, uh, of the ethical. And so um, that's why I felt that it was uh, so, and there are other facts that are uh, rolling around in my mind um, that if I have the time to share them with you. Uh, and that is that Felix Adler um, very early on offered a scholarship uh, for somebody to study at Harvard, somebody to study philosophy at Harvard. And Kaplan was one of the people that was offered that scholarship, and he rejected it because Felix Adler had rejected the Jewish source of the ethical. And in that period of uh, Harvard philosophy, there was William James and Josiah Royce and George Santiana, and Kaplan could have studied with those people at that point. And the man that accepted that scholarship was Morris Raphael Cohen, who became a very, very important personality in Jewish philosophy in, in America. Thanks. OK, so many questions. Um, Jane? I'll just repeat after you. Um, Hebrew University is the modern Mishkan. When I went to college, I don't know if it's true anymore, but there was a core curriculum. You had to take um, certain science, social science, whatever. Um, was there a core curriculum at Hebrew University, and what, with your, with your un or his understanding of it as the modern Mishkan, what was, was there anything that was required of students coming in to, uh, tie-in with that notion of the Mishkan? Well, uh, well, uh, let me just say, uh, let me just say a couple of words. Uh, what's interesting about the Hebrew University at the present moment is the courses that they have where the canons of Western scholarship are applied to Jewish uh, issues. And the point is that you, and I know people who have doctorates in Talmud, doctorates in Talmud, and that is Talmud as it is studied in the yeshiva, but that is Talmud as it is studied by people who have uh, a scientific attitude. Uh, and it is also the case with Tanakh, and I don't know if you're aware, there's a man who passed away recently, uh, uh, a man by the name of Moshe Greenberg, um, who was the son of Simon Greenberg, who was the provost at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and he was the head of the Bible um, department. And there was a Jewish history department, and there was so on and so forth. And so a lot of the things that scholars uh, produce come out of the uh, uh, curriculum at the uh, 
Jewish Theological Seminary. And one should mention from the very early on, at the beginning, one should mention Gershon, Kohl, Gershon Shalom, Gershon Shalom, who was there uh, really from the very beginning as a uh, teacher of the Kabbalah. And we'll keep, keep moving on. Mel. Rabbi, uh, Rabbi nice to see you. Uh, Steve Guto, yes, thanks. <laughs> Um, just two quick questions, and you don't have to answer either. You have to speak into the microphone I like can hear you. How about now? Yeah. All right. <laughs> two quick questions. If you can answer either one would be great. One is, what was Kaplan's view? Right now, we live in a world where we're really engaged in interfaith relations. We have to be to make any, any sense out of anything because uh, that's what the world is. And I'm sure Kaplan, living through, the, living through what happened in Europe, and, and the Second World War must really have had to deal with that. So what was his view of how we deal with the fact that we need close relationships and close understandings between Jews and Catholics or Jews and Muslims or whatever? That's one. And the second one you can skip if you want. But I know that this was a big issue from so many of my friends that went to JTS, that there was a, a real battle between in their minds, or it was discussed, between Kaplan and Heschel, even though they respected each other. So if you can add anything to that, that would be a real treat. But either one, either one. OK, yes. I would venture to say, in terms of the first question, that Kaplan um, was ecumenical from the beginning. He was ecumenical from the beginning because he didn't really believe that there was one way one could be ethical, one could go for Shlemut, and the particulars really didn't matter. Um, he was in contact with Harry Emerson Fosdick at an early period. He was in contact with John Haynes Holmes at a particular period. Um, and uh, uh, even though he differed, he was also in contact with uh, Reinhold Niebuhr. Uh, and so um, uh, Kaplan was very, very uh, open to uh, cooperation uh, among the different uh, um, religious groups. Um, in, terms of the, in terms of the second question, uh, uh, Kaplan and Heschel, uh, they, uh, are much more, in a certain sense, alike uh, than I think they are different. In other words, uh, people present Heschel um, as the mystic, uh, Kaplan as the rationalist, um, but they were both um, uh, dedicated to the life of the Jewish people. Um, they lived uh, closely, they shared uh, offices, in the same building at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And um, as a matter of fact, it may be that uh, Kaplan is responsible for Heschel coming to the seminary. In other words, Heschel had come to America uh, in 1940, and uh, he was brought here by the Hebrew Union College who wanted to save scholars and rabbis who were being persecuted by the Nazis. And so he ended up in Cincinnati. And Heschel's um, linguistic uh, abilities were so great that he published um, an essay in English uh, two years, three years, because he had spent some time in England uh, after he came uh, to America. And it is called an analysis of piety, an analysis of piety. And Kaplan, it's published in the uh, um, Journal of the American Academy of Religion. And the point is that, that Kaplan read the essay and he liked it very, very, very much. He liked what, Ka what Heschel had to say about piety because what what Heschel said was that piety was not something that was simply uh, uh, subjective. 
it was something that was objective and existed apart from the individual, which, I, which is also difficult for me to understand to this moment what it means that piety is not a simple attitude, <laughs> but it exists objectively. But that is what attracted Kaplan, and he writes that in his journal. But more importantly, I think, he does something which I present as a challenge to you, I present, because I don't want to leave before I challenge you in some kind of way. This is a very, very select audience. It's a very intelligent audience. And the point is that what Kaplan did is he took uh, Heschel's essay, an analysis of piety, and he turned it into a poem. He turned it into a poem. And that was published, and I have published it in one of my books. Uh, I have published it a number of times. And the point is that I offer you as a challenge when something is very, um, I can't get too personal here, but the point is that I have offered this as a challenge to my wife. I mean, <laughs> but that's not too personal. <laughs> and, and I want to say publicly that she has written some magnificent poetry that summarizes whole books, and I can't get over that. So when you read something, and I assume that you are readers, I ask you to try to put it in the form of a poem. And Mordechai Kaplan did that with Heschel. He also did it uh, with Leo Beck, uh, and he did it with other. And you can find some of these in the back of the prayer book, uh, Kol Hanushama, and you can find it in the back of the 1945 prayer book. Sorry, this is the last question, but we have a whole day ahead of us. Thank you, Mel. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm David Katz. Thanks for that really stimulating uh, lecture. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Pointed at my mouth, my wife says. Um, I was really fascinated to hear the name of Nietzsche come up in his early influences. Um, and it, it pretty much expected and when you're talking about individualism and all of that. But, uh, and of course, Nietzsche was a tremendous stimulus in those days and everything. But uh, that leads us to concepts of the Ubermensch, and uh, there were excesses in Nietzsche. So I was wondering what, uh, what the influence really was of Nietzsche on Kaplan. Well, the, the point is, the point is that the I uh, uh, find uh, the point is, in, in a certain sense, everybody who was uh, an intellectual uh, in that generation was influenced by Nietzsche. There is an in, a man who is Kaplan's uh, primary enemy, in a certain sense. His name is Louis Ginsburg, and uh, he was a very, very important Talmudist at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and he, in his writings, talks about human, all too human, which was one of Nietzsche's works. And so I think Nietzsche made such a fantastic um, impression that everybody was th thinking. And uh, um, when I came across that quotation, that quotation uh, in one of Kaplan's earliest uh, diaries, which where Nietzsche said, I'll repeat it, I read only those who write with their blood. I read only those who write with their blood. And Kaplan 
was a person who uh, rode, rode with their blood. <coughs> In terms of, of Ubermensch, I accept, I don't know whether you're acquainted with it or not, probably you are, and you know it very well. I accept the uh, view of Walter Kaufman, who writes on Nietzsche, and Kaufman presents us with a humanistic vision of the U Ubermensch. And so um, if I can uh, make a combination of things, I would say that the perfected individual, the move towards perfection, which is contained in the Kaplan diary and which is Schleimut, you know, that's the image of the Ubermensch. Uh, and if you want to know the details, you have to read Kaufman, who was challenged on this. But I see that, the, in, other, in other words, I, I see it in other places too. I see it in the works of Abraham Maslow, who I've been reading, who talks about the pyramid of needs. And at the top, at the top, is not just the person who has ecstatic experiences, but is the person who uh, is moved by the need to be altruistic. That stands at the top of the uh, pyramid. And that is the hardest. That's the hardest for all of us to, to get to that point to be truly altruistic. So. Thank you for those wonderful, wonderful remarks. And I wanted everyone to know that in 10 minutes, you should be downstairs. Um, we're going to have our first panel there, which will be a wonderful panel discussing SAJ in time and space. And it will feature David Kaufman, it will feature Deborah Dash Moore, it will feature Professor Jeffrey Gurak, and um, please join us down there. In the meantime, there were refreshments down there. And if you like, you can also see the wonderful exhibit from the archives um, during the breaks. So this is your first break and 2.30 down in the sanctuary. Oh, thank you. <laughs>